Hey heroes, welcome to another fearless episode of History of the Marvel Universe. This channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description along with other places you can find me. The backstory of the woman named Mary Alice Walker is one that is rife with tragedy, trauma, and abuse. And so please be aware that some of the topics we'll be mentioning in this video may be upsetting for some viewers. Mary's pain first began before she was even born, as the sound of her parents screaming at each other echoed across the surface of her mother's womb. After her parents separated, Mary was raised by a father who molested her when she was still just an infant. She began to associate the sound of her father's approaching footsteps with the unwanted touching that came afterwards and would shut her eyes tightly whenever it happened. Eventually, after enduring this obscene treatment time and again, Mary clenched her entire body and retreated into her own unconscious mind. As she did, her repressed hatred and rage bubbled to the surface in the form of a second personality. This alternate persona lashed out at her abuser, screaming and clawing in a wild, frenzied attack. Blinded by his injuries, Mary's father fell into a depression and replaced one form of abuse with another, neglect. Mary, meanwhile, developed dissociative identity disorder in the wake of everything she had been through. In her more innocent persona, she was gentle, timid, and artistic. More importantly, innocent Mary was unaware of both her other self and the abuse she suffered as an infant, blocking out any evidence of either. She dropped out of school to take care of her blind father, surviving on disability checks, although he barely ate. He constantly ignored his daughter and even stopped paying for electricity until their home had no television, refrigerator, or even light. Every day, Mary lived in fear of the darkness that enveloped her home after sunset. Occasionally, her other persona would emerge and take control, a much more violent and malevolent version of herself. Wanting to protect herself and her altar, it was this Mary who discovered her body's latent abilities. Practicing on the corpse of a dead pigeon, she learned to move small objects with her mind and set them alight. She also developed a limited form of telepathy, which allowed her to implant ideas or psychic suggestions in others. The source of these seemingly supernatural abilities was actually hidden in her genes. Mary Walker, you see, was a mutant. While innocent Mary remained unaware of these abilities, her altar used them to burn down their childhood home. It's possible that the more violent Mary also killed her father, but the truth of this has been questioned. In any event, following her father's death, Mary was institutionalized at the Creed Psychiatric Hospital in Hell's Kitchen, where her DID was diagnosed. However, the doctors were unable to explain many of the physiological differences between her two alters. As Innocent Mary, she often fell ill and was prone to epileptic seizures. Her more violent persona, meanwhile, manifested with a different heart rate, EEG pattern, and even a unique scent. Perhaps most notably, this alter ran a constant fever and thus was named Typhoid. While generally uncontrollable and even murderous at times, Typhoid cooperated with tests of her psionic abilities, if only to practice using them. The discovery of these powers also caught the attention of those who wished to harness and exploit them, including Project Psyche, the delayed ninth iteration of the Clandestine Weapon Plus program. Their level of involvement is unconfirmed, but it's been reported that Weapon 9 attempted to control other mutant subjects with medication without success. The gentle, innocent Mary went along with the various testings and treatments, finding comfort in Catholic prayer. But then one day, she gained a new cellmate, a Greek martial artist named Electra Nachios. 
When their third cellmate, a woman named Lizzie, cut her wrist with a makeshift cross that Mary was using, Electra quickly bandaged the wound. However, she also used this as an opportunity to escape when the guard noticed what had happened and opened the door to check on the situation. Electra insisted on getting Mary out as well, although her innocent persona protested. Regardless, the violence and blood awakened Typhoid, who aided the escape by using her powers to get past a bolted steel door. Of course, Mary denied that she was the one to have done so, and upon escaping, the two women went their separate ways. Mary laid low for a while after that. Her innocent persona remained unaware of typhoid, but sometimes awakened in unfamiliar surroundings with bruises she didn't remember getting. About a year after escaping, she found success as a stage actress, a role she excelled in despite her timid nature. However, typhoid decided to put an end to this career, and Mary disappeared from the spotlight. With her life uprooted yet again, she later turned to sex work as a means to survive. Crafting a false identity for herself, she dyed her hair blonde and used the pseudonym Lila Hughes. At 19 years old, she used this false identity while working in a brothel run by a woman named Donna Lopez. As Lila, Mary befriended Donna and claimed to have run away from her home in New Mexico to escape her sexually abusive father. And with this story containing elements of truth, Donna recognized the young woman's pain. But then one day, the brothel was invaded by a man in a mask who targeted one of their customers, a limo driver named Angelo. The girls initially feared that this was some kind of raid, but there was more to the assault than any of them realized. The man behind the mask was actually a young Matt Murdock, who would soon be known as the vigilante Daredevil. His target, meanwhile, was an employee of Roscoe Sweeney, the Fixer, and one of the men responsible for the death of Murdoch's father. Naturally unaware of this, the girls assumed that the masked man was a threat and attacked him. With his enhanced senses overwhelmed, Murdoch lashed out and tried to force the women away. As a result, Lila was struck and knocked backwards through a nearby window. Hitting the street below, broken and bloody, Lila seemingly died in a tragedy that would haunt Matt Murdock for years to come. However, as this false identity of Lila Hughes breathed its last, Typhoid Mary bubbled to the surface and assumed control. But this time, things were different. While the innocent Mary Alter still existed, Typhoid began fronting more often. Furthermore, she swore that the injuries sustained in the fall would be the last that she ever suffered at the hands of a man. While she remained rebellious and violent, as an adult, Typhoid also grew manipulative and lustful, often using sex and sexuality to get what she wanted. The outfits she wore were often provocative, and she soon established her trademark look by painting the right half of her face white. During this time, she met a mercenary known as T-Ray, and the two started a relationship that lasted for several months. However, this ended badly when T-Ray ultimately abandoned her in Central America with a shotgun strapped to her throat. As a side note, I will mention that T-Ray as a character is somewhat noteworthy because he has claimed to be the real Wade Wilson, alleging that the mercenary Deadpool stole his identity. There has been evidence disputing this claim, but technically no definitive proof one way or the other. But after he left her in Belize, Typhoid returned to the United States, moving her criminal career to Chicago, where she specialized in robbery and blackmail. She subsequently made her way back to Hell's Kitchen, where she attacked a number of drug houses and gambling dens in an attempt to seize money and control. It was this that caught the attention of Wilson Fisk, the kingpin of crime, who unearthed much of Mary's past. He was further impressed when she used her powers to fight her way past his security and confront him directly. Rather than retaliate, the kingpin seized this opportunity to recruit Typhoid Mary into his war against Daredevil with a million dollar bounty. 
However, she was hired not to kill him, but simply to torment him by making him fall in love with her. Now, by this point, Fisk knew that Daredevil was Matt Murdock, allowing Mary to target him in his civilian identity. Furthermore, Typhoid had grown strong enough to influence her other persona's behavior without innocent Mary ever realizing. Drawing on her experience taking care of her father, Mary posed as a volunteer social worker while Typhoid used her power of telepathic suggestion to get close to Murdoch. Controlled by her other self, Mary slowly seduced Murdoch, despite his involvement with another woman, Karen Page. Meanwhile, Typhoid Mary would periodically attack Daredevil in costume. In these encounters, not only did the subtle physiological differences between her alters prevent Daredevil from recognizing her as Mary, but her telepathy also stopped his radar sense from seeing her clearly. However, Innocent Mary started falling in love with Murdoch, strengthening her will enough to begin asserting control more often. During another encounter between Typhoid and Daredevil, Mary switched to her innocent persona to prevent her more violent alter from hurting him. These switches confused and frightened the innocent Mary, as she didn't fully comprehend what was happening. While she didn't understand her disorder, she did have moments of lucidity in which she recognized that something within her was making her do things she otherwise wouldn't. Other times, she was seemingly oblivious to evidence of her altar, as if her role in the system was to remain innocent and incognizant. For example, in one of the scheduled meetings between Fisk and Typhoid, Innocent Mary showed up knowing they had an appointment, but seemingly unaware of the details. That encounter was made all the more awkward by the fact that Typhoid had already begun to seduce Fisk into a physical relationship. When a timid Mary rebuffed his attempts to touch her, admitting that she only wanted to be touched by Matt Murdock, the Kingpin told her to leave, knowing she would eventually return as her other self. There were also instances in which the two alters would talk directly, with Typhoid berating and insulting Mary for simply wanting to be with Matt. Meanwhile, as the relationship between Fisk and Typhoid grew more intimate, it also grew more tense as each one attempted to assert their will over the other. Things started to reach a tipping point when Typhoid feared that Mary's love for Murdoch would eventually allow the innocent persona to become dominant more permanently. Seeking to prevent this, she went against the Kingpin's orders and hired a number of villains to savagely batter Daredevil. Beaten and bruised, the masked vigilante was clinging to the edge of a bridge suspended over an overgrown rail line. Typhoid Mary arrived to finish the job herself, dropping him 50 feet to the ground below. When he asked why she was doing this, she simply remarked that she had to kill him because she loved him. This betrayal of Kingpin's orders resulted in a physical altercation between Fisk and Typhoid, which then ended in another sexual encounter. This, however, was another of Typhoid's manipulation tactics, as she wanted Fisk to think that he had reasserted his dominance. Later, Innocent Mary awakened atop the same bridge that Daredevil had been dropped from. Cut, bruised, and sore, she contemplated jumping from the edge, wanting to kill what she perceived as an evil presence inside of herself. But below, she witnessed Daredevil still clinging to life even as he was being attacked by a strange monster. This creature, actually a possessed vacuum cleaner, was a result of the Inferno, a demonic invasion from the hellish Limbo dimension that was ultimately thwarted by the X-Men and their allies. Mary tried to help her beloved, but when the demonic appliance exploded, she instinctively shifted to Typhoid to protect herself from the debris. Intending on finishing what she started, Typhoid revealed her dual identity to Daredevil. However, the innocent persona saved him by asserting control once again and brought him to a hospital for treatment. There, she met Matt's actual live-in girlfriend, Karen Page, who was shocked to find another woman claiming to love her boyfriend. When a delirious daredevil muttered Mary's name, Karen left, ending their relationship. 
When a disillusioned Murdoch left New York to recover, Typhoid Mary took a job from Doctor Doom, or at least one of his Doom bots. Her mission this time was to steal Chimelian technology from Dr. James Power, and eliminate his superhuman children, the Power Pack. Typhoid again manipulated her innocent persona, who befriended Power's oldest son, Alex. While innocent Mary enjoyed having someone to talk to, Typhoid berated her once again, claiming that she didn't deserve happiness or friendship. But in the end, Typhoid Mary betrayed Doom by abandoning her mission, instead tricking the Doombot into revealing secrets about his creator's past. She subsequently returned to New York, where she encountered a cannibalistic creature called Lifeform. Originally an agent of AIM named George Prufrock, this being was mutated into its monstrous state by an experimental virus. Happening upon life form in a dark alley, Typhoid attempted to slay the creature, but found her powers ineffective against it. Fighting her way to the surface, Innocent Mary took control and interrupted the battle. With voices in its own head compelling it to feed on human flesh, life form sympathized with Mary's conflicting personas and left her alone. She also continued working with the Kingpin, standing alongside him during a conflict with the Red Skull. For the next part of our story, we must turn our attention toward a clandestine organization known simply as The Project. This enigmatic program used a form of psychic surgery to transform soldiers into controllable assassins. This process was performed on a war veteran named Brian Roberts when he agreed to work for them. However, when he later tried to retire, he found that a device they'd implanted in his head continued to receive signals compelling him to kill. Wanting to expose this organization, he uncovered the name of another supposed project creation, Mary Walker. It's been presumed that this is because the project had obtained records and files on Typhoid Mary dating back to her time being institutionalized, and may have been among those who tested and evaluated her abilities. One might also hypothesize a connection between this project and the Weapon Plus program's Project Psyche, which also allegedly played a part in the creation of Typhoid Mary, but the details are unconfirmed and it's important to note that the ultimate source of Mary's superhuman abilities is her mutant X gene. The important thing for today is that Roberts believed that there was a connection between Walker and the project. Seeking help, he approached the mutant adventurer, Logan, aka Wolverine, aka Weapon X, and told him what he knew. Investigating further, Logan contacted Mary, meeting her innocent persona, who naturally had no knowledge of the project. However, she had again suppressed any awareness of her identity disorder, and wondered if the organization in question was responsible for her blackouts and lost time. She joined Logan in his investigation and also found herself attracted to him. The two subsequently uncovered a lab where the project engaged in animal testing. While Innocent Mary wished they could liberate the captive creatures, Logan broke into a safe containing videotapes documenting the project's psychic surgery techniques. While reviewing these, however, Typhoid was able to come to the surface and attacked Logan. The two clashed twice, and each time Typhoid used her pyrokinesis to badly burn her opponent before escaping. While all this was going on, Brian Roberts succumbed to the signals he was receiving and began killing again. Logan attempted to track him down and stop him, but by the time he found him, Roberts had already taken his own life to stop himself. Meanwhile, Mary grew despondent over her altar, driving away someone she cared about yet again. She tracked down the project's mastermind, Sidney Jorn, and tried to convince him to use his psychic surgery to eliminate her typhoid persona. Jorn intended on betraying Mary by sabotaging the process and killing her, but he was ultimately thwarted by Wolverine while typhoid broke free. Mary then switched back and forth between her two personas, killing several project members before injuring Wolverine and escaping as typhoid once again. Left alone with the Mastermind, Logan attempted to prevent any further heartache from the project by decapitating Jorn. 
Typhoid returned to the Kingpin's side and to his bed, but Fisk was growing increasingly frustrated by her disappearances and lack of efficacy. Furthermore, by this point, Daredevil had fully recovered and returned, renewing his war against Fisk. As a part of this, he gave the Kingpin a reminder of his estranged wife, Vanessa, furthering the divide between Fisk and Typhoid. Seeking to prove herself, Typhoid confronted a gang of drug smugglers, intent on strong-arming them into doubling their payouts to the Kingpin. This meeting was interrupted by Daredevil, who goaded her into another battle. This time, however, instead of fighting her, Daredevil disarmed and seduced Mary. Typhoid was taken aback by his sudden forwardness, and ultimately he succeeded in drawing innocent Mary to the front. He brought her to a motel where the two stayed together until Mary fell asleep, but this too was part of his plan. When Mary awakened the next morning, Matt was gone and she was confronted by people from the Department of Social Services. While she was sleeping, Daredevil was planting forged documents that demanded a court-ordered psychiatric evaluation for Mary under the false name Mary Manzini's. Switching between an enraged typhoid and a broken-hearted Mary, both were too confused to resist being committed against their will. Conflicted by what he had done, Daredevil hoped that things would work out and that Mary would get the help she needed. However, this wasn't her first time being institutionalized, and Typhoid was crafty. Despite the best efforts of her doctors, Typhoid feigned taking her medication while she watched and waited for her opportunity to escape once again. An opportunity that she would soon find and capitalize on. Now, there is much more we could talk about in the life of Mary Walker, not least of which being the eventual emergence of two more alters. But if you want to know about that, then be sure to let me know in the comments below. Because that is all I have for you this week, and thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, all of the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me. Let me give a special shout out to all of my Patreon and Ko-fi supporters, Twitch subscribers, and YouTube members, all of which help make the channel possible. By signing up for any ongoing amount on any of these platforms, you'll get your name in these special thanks, but Patreon is the one that helps determine what topics get covered on the channel via monthly polls. That being said, if there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, be sure to let me know in the comments. But that is indeed all I have for you this week, and so until next time, true believers, uh, Excelsior!